All right, thanks. So um, we've been around, Exxon has been around for about two and a half years, a little over now. Our office is just in the north side of Ames. Um, I think we're at, the number moves around a little bit, I think we're at roughly 15 full-time employees, another maybe 10 to 12 part-time, including our intern program, some contractors we work with. If you're ever in Ames, stop on through. We're just on the north side by the cafe up there. One of the things I like to do is give people some perspective of where we sit in this chaos right now. It's kind of amazing. You guys are inundated all the time with information and data services coming at you from all different arenas. Really good stuff in a lot of ways. Uh, a lot of it's uh, being built out on the coasts. Really smart data and software people. We don't always see that uh, actually being tied to real decisions and fields and understanding some of the intricacies there. Overall though, what we're seeing here, this is going to be great for farmers. It's going to be great for agriculture long term. We do notice a few things so. We make a lot of decisions year in and year out around managing a unit of land. One of the things that we see is the services that are being built right now tend to focus pretty exclusively on this agronomic compartment. Now that makes sense from a business standpoint, right? That's where we spend most of our money, that's where we make most of our money. The reality is though that the information that we have at our fingertips, both public and private, can impact a broader range of decisions than it's necessarily being pointed at. So we call this our precision business planning process. What we're trying to do here is leverage that information that's available into this broader range of decisions that we make year in and year out. So we're putting some products into to three verticals here. We work in that financial and real estate space quite a bit. Uh, we've got a farm management service offering that's uh, growing pretty well right now. We're also seeing a lot of interest with the different constraints we've got on us uh, from lenders. What we'll talk about primarily here is this retail ag deployment of our precision business planning process, our flagship product delivery, that being our profit zone manager. But we also work in this conservation, sustainability, and compliance arena. And the interesting thing that we see is that these things are more tied together than maybe what we realize. So I'm gonna run you guys through an example quick here that'll connect the agronomic conservation and financial pieces of this equation pretty explicitly. Nothing looks odd or strange or out of the ordinary when you guys see these maps. Uh, these are just standard maps. It could be anything, right? It could be yield data, could be some sort of uh, soil properties, uh, other kinds of things that we might measure out there. The reality is, it's business performance. Right now, we do not manage our fields like businesses. What I mean when I say that is that we work to maximize revenue on every acre of every field when not every acre has significant revenue producing potential. What we see is about three to 15% of almost every field is consistently not profitable. There's a number of acres on top of that that tend to be pretty mobile, depending on the specific conditions within a growing season. Once we understand this, there's a few things that we start to see. One of them right off the top is, right now there's this notion out there that environmental performance and economic performance are competitive. When we're making field scale decisions, that is often true. But once we understand the scale that business performance varies within our fields, they're actually re really synergistic. And it's very simple, right? Places and fields where we're ineffective at turning our inputs into commodities, we have poor economic performance, and we tend to have higher loss factors, poor environmental performance. This is really important for us as we move forward uh, with some of the things that we'll see. I like to look at this field. Okay, this is uh, 145 acres in Cerro Gordo County, Iowa. We farmed this field for a long time. 2010, it was the second week of December, uh, we got a cancellation notice on the lease. We were just coming out of the first year of a three-year lease. This is owned by a large investor. I had about 50,000 acres in the state at the time. Okay, and what happened, commodity prices were starting to run. Land prices were coming up quick. He said, hey, I'm gonna, get the return off of this, I need to hit the reset button on all my leases. We had seven farms with them at the time, so we got the cancellation notice on all of them. Then one Saturday afternoon, he rented out some high school gyms and held a lease auction, and auctioned off three-year leases on 50,000 acres. Right? You guys might remember this. It happened in January of 2011, I think, is when the actual auction was. We lost all seven farms uh, in, in terms of this one. We knew at the time we could pay 365 an acre and make money. It went for 495. It was go. It went for 495 last year still, right? We have it back now. 
This is the exciting thing. Now I can take this field that we've worked on forever and show what we're actually going to do with it. We actually have four of the seven fields back. Wouldn't surprise me if we get another one or two before uh, the crop grows in the ground this year. We got one of them back in March of last year, actually. So this field's interesting because it's a little bit more variable than an average Iowa field. We've got a sandy ridge that cuts through here. A little bit of water issues up in the northwest, northeast corners. But what we've done with this is take the precision data we had over a number of years, split the field into 10 meter grid cells, and we use a little bit of additional simulation in to kind of create a broader actuarial basis for this particular scenario. The way we look at this field is 6,048 independent retail franchises. Okay, so a retail franchise out in the middle of nowhere where this field sits has a different revenue potential than the same one, say, in downtown Chicago. Doesn't mean that they both can't be profitable. It does mean they have to be managed differently in order to achieve that profitability. So by grid sell by year, with what we've done in this field, what we see is a profit of about 47 bucks an acre, about right. Standard deviation of about 235, also about right. Folks outside ag will ask how the heck that works. Well, we got crop insurance, right? We buffer the bottom end, we run home happy on the top end of that. What we want to do is think about what we can do about it. This is a little academic, but just stay with me for a second here, okay? What we've done in this case is grab every grid cell that loses $250 per acre per year or more, and we literally stop farming it, okay? We're still gonna pay cash rent. We're still gonna have the same operational fixed costs, same equipment fleet working over fewer acres. But when we do this, we see the profit go up quite a bit, and that standard deviation comes down to about half of where it was before. Now, in extreme cases like this, where we have severe revenue limitations, sometimes we like to think about what we call alternative low-cost revenue sources. So in this case, we grabbed every cell losing $200 per acre per year or more, and we created a generic <coughs> alternative management. This could be a conservation program. It could be a forage market. It could be an energy market or a recreation market. We really don't care. All we're going to ask these areas to do is function at that $200 per acre crop budget loss. It's really important. We're not asking it to compete with corn. We're not even necessarily asking it to make money. We're asking it to be a lower cost buffer against the kinds of losses we were seeing before. When we do this, we more than double the profit and that standard deviation stays down in a reasonable realm. So over enough acres, what we tend to see is our fields bucket themselves into three kinds of zones. Revenue zones are about 75 to 95% of almost every field. This is where it makes sense to point our working capital towards maximizing revenue. Essentially what we do on every acre now, all right? No cost zones are these places where there's no historical precedent that dictates that we should commit the amount of money that we have to commit to try and produce a row crop on. There's no magic here and there's no secrets. We know where these places are. Everybody that spends time out in fields knows where these are at, right? There's nothing surprising here. What we do see though is when we move from stacked yield maps and some of that gut instinct to real business performance metrics, particularly in the context of testing alternatives, our minds start to shift and change a little bit. The expense limited zone takes us back to that retail franchise example. So if I bring this back into a field, let's say that we've got 10 acres of a lighter soil as an example in here. If we go in to our retailer and say, look, we've got this revenue problem on these 10 acres, what are we gonna to start to do about this? Uh, options typically presented are gonna be, well, we need to get you into the drought resistant seed traits, right? We might be spending some more money there. We need to get you into five splits on our nitrogen application because that soil just can't hold it. And essentially, the answer for my revenue problem is spend more money. Okay. Where there is an agronomic problem that can be fixed, it should be fixed. But we have to understand the inherent revenue limitations in order to make sure that our working capital is distributed right. Often here you might be looking at 15,000 seeds an acre, 70 pounds of N. Then I freed up several thousand dollars to point to the parts of the field where I actually get a return. So that's what we're trying to do here. Is we're trying to transition from our current dynamic of revenue focused agronomic planning to return on investment focused agronomic planning. And even more so, we're trying to make sure every dollar that we're committing gets a return to the greatest extent possible. What's really important about this, it is not an optimization problem. Every field, farming operation, landowner, tenant relationship are unique in terms of what they can handle and what they want to take on 
with these kinds of management systems. It has to be a conversation and it has to account for those unique characteristics uh, as we move through. What we're trying to build out and deploy, we call it our precision business planning workflow. It's a six step process. We'll walk through these in a little bit of detail. Our Profit Zone Manager is our software and data management tool that facilitates it. But this is an interaction. This is a human interaction process, right, as we go through in order to get this done. So we have to start with some intelligence gathering. The upside of this is that the data is available. All of the information we need to do a pretty good job of this is at our fingertips right now. Then we move into a business performance <coughs> review. We're going to give you the key business performance metrics from about a 10-foot resolution in every field all the way to your whole enterprise. When we do this, we get this key metric. We call it our return ratio. I actually think we're going to transition that to an opportunity ratio um, is in terms of what we call it. This is the key metric we look at. It's got two pieces to it. All right, We're going to tell you the percentage of your land farmed with an expected negative return and the number of dollars of working capital committed against an expected negative return. The latter of those is an absolutely shocking number. Uh, it's really amazing when we get in and start to actually see what that's doing to us. Once we have that, we move into a negative return assessment. That's the why. Why do we have a problem on the acres that are a problem? Then we figure out how to, to work the business planning to deal with it. These steps are part of this precision business plan that we want to move in front of the agronomic plan. All right, let's create the, the plan to allocate our working capital focused on return across and within our fields. Then once we have that, creating the agronomic plan to execute that business plan is usually pretty straightforward. But like any plan, once we get in season, it's wrong. So we've got this component that's the in-season plan adjustments. What we see with this, generally speaking, and this is with my farmer hat on, we tend to spend, sometimes haphazardly, once we get in season to protect a crop that we see, feel, and touch, without fully recognizing what we're doing to the incremental cost of the bushel, and subsequently our return. It's just a tendency that we have, uh, and, and there's a lot of interesting opportunities in there. So moving into this with a little bit of detail, the intelligence gathering, we really need three pieces. We need a field boundary, we need your precision machine data, okay, and we've got a data translator engine where we can consume raw data from any yield monitor, as applied monitor, as planted monitor on the market, turn it into usable spatial data, and then we need a crop budget. We make this pretty simple. We preload all of the land-grant university published crop budgets that are out there. It's about where 95% of people want to start. And then there's an interface where we can come in and start to customize this for your operation at whatever level you want to, uh, all the way down to every accounting line item if that's where you want to go with it. What we tend to see is as folks get started working from some of the templates that are available uh, as an initial <coughs> indicator is usually a pretty good place uh, to get going. And then you start to, to work these kinds of numbers in to your actual financial statement as you're really honing this business plan. Then we move into the business performance review. And here's a couple of pictures from our operation this year, right? We actually had a pretty good year. We do all non-GMO. We have had it sold two years out, so we sold a bunch of corn over five bucks this year and had really good yields. So all things said, it actually came out fairly well for us. This is an example of a field where we get some of these business performance metrics and this, prof this is a profit map that you're looking at here. Here's a list of our fields and a uh, subset of the fields. We had, I had to cut it off here, obviously. Uh, ranked by ROI. The banker loves that. Let me tell you, when dad goes in to, to do the financial statement, he's got his list of fields ranked by ROI, the summary data all the way underneath it. Uh, that, that worked really well in the conversation on what we're going to do. One of the things I point out right away, if you give a farmer or give yourselves a list of your fields ranked by ROI or profit or whatever business performance metric you're interested in, What's the first thing that we always are going to do? We're going to go to the bottom of the list, and we're going to start to say, how do I fix this? Right, that's, that's generally what we're going to do. When we walk through this process on our operation, the first field that we're making a change to was the most profitable field in the entire operation. The reason? It's obvious. i got 10 acres of potholes in this thing that on the best year that we've ever had farming in, period, end of story, still lost me over 500 bucks an acre. What am I doing? 
right? I take these 10 acres of potholes, they're going into CRP, landlord's gonna get a little bit more money from the CRP payment than what uh, we were paying them in cash rent, and my ROI on this field, the best one in the operation, goes up another two and a half points just that quick. This is what we're seeing happen over and over again, is these fields that on our financial statement would be a checkbox, right? All right, good to go, buy the inputs, head into it next year. We're finding these changes that uh, start to make some, some real impacts. We got a couple examples we'll talk about there. So once we get that, that business performance review, we get these return ratio or these opportunity ratio numbers out of it. I'm going to take you back to this field again, and we're going to work on this one. I'll show you guys what we're actually doing to it uh, next year. When we come in and look at this, uh, one of the things that we do when we think about production efficiency, we don't like to talk about bushels per acre. Uh, we like to talk about bushels per thousand dollars spent. Right, that's a more even metric that helps us understand what we're really doing from an efficiency standpoint. Right? The guys that win the yield competitions, probably not making very much money. Right? That revenue metric as that key indicator uh, is not a very good one. So we like to put it in context of actual efficiency relative to our working capital. Now in this field, this opportunity ratio is 23%. That means 23% of the land area in this field is being <coughs> operated at an expected negative return, an expected loss. That's a little higher than what an average would be. Uh, 10 is pretty darn common, honestly. 23% is operated at an expected loss. That equates to a misallocation of working capital of $26,000. We're spending $26,000 in this field knowing that it's going to be a negative return, generally speaking, across the aggregate. Now, if we think about managing 1,000 retail franchises, okay, are we gonna be happy if any one of those functions at a loss? No, we're not. We're gonna figure out what changes we have to make, and if we start making changes and we can't get there, we're gonna shut them down, okay? From what we can tell, row crop agriculture is the only place in the universe where as a business, we're willing to spend money against an expected loss. One of the characteristics of this is how much the cost structures have escalated over the last 15 to 18 years, right? We've moved into a category where we really need to function as a business. So once we get this, you know, this histogram kind of gives us a really good picture. And this is uh, the number of acres at these different profit levels in the field. One of the things that happened early on when we were rolling this out, I remember sitting down with a young sales agronomist in uh, southern Minnesota, and he looked at this, he goes, you guys have screwed this all up, right? It's like, there's no way a farmer can lose 500 bucks an acre uh, in their fields. Why is that? He said, crop insurance. So hold on, young man, right? Crop insurance pays in the aggregate. We're buying enterprise and optional units on revenue protection. Almost every field we see has places that lose four or 500 bucks an acre. Sometimes they're pretty small, but they're almost always there. That number is real, and it's, it's really impactful for what we're doing. So once we have that, we move into the negative return assessment. This is the why. It tends to fall into three categories primarily. Agronomic issues, Things like fertility, things like seed trait crop protection mixes, the stuff that we work on very regularly, okay? We also see the land improvement side. We understand this a lot. We tend to throw tile at problems that maybe we don't get the return that we actually think that we're getting. I know tile's helpful, but that's an interesting story that starts to emerge there. But there's some broader uh, things that we can do around water management in this category. And then we see this bigger category that we call working capital allocation. And this is where we're looking at, do we understand our real revenue potential and are we focusing our dollars on return? So in the case of this field, it's pretty easy. We come in, this is just a screen capture. We've identified which parts of the field have an expected negative return. When we do this, we've got our soil map that shows us it's 85% sand fraction soil through there and it sits on a ridge. Pretty easy, I, I don't know what I can do about that. There's, there's no magic in that case, right? That's pretty informative as we go through. So once we understand the why, we move into the business planning side. It tends to be four categories of decisions. Again, our agronomic pieces that we want to fix when we can, our land improvement pieces. We actually see the precision management tools that we have available as being as much or maybe even more about cost containment than they are about revenue enhancement. All right? This is a really powerful set of tools 
uh, for us to make sure that our working capital is managed, focused on return for every dollar. And then we've got this bucket of alternative low-cost revenue sources. And I run the risk of sounding like I'm pushing conservation programs. That's not necessarily the case. This is a whole range of business models that tend to have some really local characteristics to them. We talk about conservation programs because the dollars are easily definable, right? They're, they're, in, they're written out for us so that we can run those business scenarios in a clean way. So what are we gonna do with this field? Well, we're gonna take 15 acres in this shape is what we decided on, and it's going into CP42. That's the pollinator program as part of CRP. First year payment will be about 385 bucks an acre. It'll cover uh, escalated seed costs, I think $100 an acre for the seed costs early on, then the, the payment will scale down. When we do this, 15 acres out of 145 acre field, right off the top we see whole field average profit go up $35 an acre. Okay, We're going to make $5,000 more spending $8,000 less on this field. Now our revenue is lower, right? We'll make a few thousand dollars less in total revenue, but our financial statement is massively improved with this. There's so a couple other things that we see on this, right? The expected ROI on this field based on our history is about 6.7%. When I talk to farmers, I say it's gotta be 10 guys. That gives me funny looks right now. Pretty hard to grab a 10% ROI with the market conditions we have. Fundamental reality though, this standard mid-tier Iowa operation, we're going to spend a million and a half bucks this year, okay? And if I have a million and a half bucks in my pocket going into the open investment market, that kind of buying power should get me into a 10% return category. So if over the long term I can't find myself getting into that category, I have to really think about what I'm doing with my money. When we make this 15 acre change, we go from that 6.7 to 11.8 five-point increase in return on 15 acres out of a 145-acre field. Another piece of this, this field's not bad other than the 15 acres of junk, but the junk makes our APH pretty low, 170 bushel, right? So if I come in and think about protecting revenue, I've got a little serious limitation here. When I make this change, and I, I don't have a, the ability to flip the switch with FSA right now, right? We're gonna have to accrue this over time. But this change, I actually can bring my APH up to 180 pretty quickly. That's an additional 40, depending on commodity prices, 40, 50 bucks in revenue protection at the same cost. That's a really big deal as I come through here. Here's another uh, picture that gives us some perspective on this. We're gonna show you how many more bushel you had to produce to get to break even on the acres that didn't make money. We see this over 100 often very, very often in our fields. And what I'd like to say pe to, to folks that, that want to try and push the agronomic solutions on this, I'd like somebody to tell me what money I can spend to get myself another 115 bushel on that ridge. And on top of that, even more bushels to pay for the additional money I spent. It's not there. It's just not there. Now, when, when we look at this, and this is actually impacting tile decisions a fair amount too, right? So uh, we had a guy who's up on the Iowa, Minnesota border, right? He had nine years of data into the system. It was a 200 acre field roughly. There's about 20 acres of bottom ground in this. We went up and sat down and talked to him. The next day, he was gonna write a great big check to tile the daylights out of that 20 acres of bottom ground. The nine year analysis showed that on average, he needed another 130 bushel an acre just to get to break even. Okay? He's like, well, there's no way. I'm not going to get that out of it. And even if you could get close to that, why do I want to write this big check and spend all this money without having a return against those dollars? There's other things I can do with those dollars that can generate me a return. So I think he's heading into the wetland program with it. And I think he likes to hunt ducks, so he might have an opportunity there. Then we move into the in-season side of things. And, he, and I don't want to talk about this a lot other than the plan's wrong once we move in season, and just re-emphasizing the fact that we have a tendency to lose track of the incremental cost of our bushels as we start to stack dollars in to protect that crop when it's in the field. And particularly understanding that as subfield scale is a really interesting opportunity. So I want to cycle back around. We talked a little bit about the regulatory issues that we could be facing. Cycle back on this just a little bit. This is nitrate leaching data from this field. It's obviously modeled. We can't 
measure that at that scale. And these models are error prone, but they can be useful if we use them right. We see this over and over again. Places where we're not making money are places where we have high loss factors with things like nitrates. Just makes sense. If I put down 200 pounds of van, I'm getting 50 bushels of corn off. I've got nitrates moving around, right? Because I've made them available for that crop. <coughs> what we see here is that we can start to have some positive environmental impacts and hopefully slow down some of these regulatory issues through a make more money conversation. <coughs> we can come in and we can start to have a make more money conversation where the outcomes on some of these other pieces of the equation naturally fall into the system. We believe this is a pretty powerful tool for us. To give you a sense of the size, scope, and scale, right? our public data is really, really amazing. We can identify all your fields out there. We can tell you what your cropping history has been. We can tell you what the yield's been within the field with a reasonable degree of accuracy. We can tell you what the uh, uh, standard expense and cost structures are in your area for your different cropping systems, what land prices likely are. <clears throat> you put all of this together, we can do a reasonable subfield cash flow on your fields almost across the whole country without any information from any farmer. Now, they're wrong, right? We don't know who's overpaying for land, we don't know who's mismanaging inputs, but it gives us a really good gauge of what's going on out there. We put this all together and there's just a paper published with some folks from Iowa State where we, we put this out and got it reviewed by folks. Uh, what we see is it's between about two and three million acres in Iowa alone that are planted at an expected loss every year uh, over the, the long span. And with that, that's over a billion dollars a year of what we call misallocated working capital. That's an incredible opportunity for us uh, as we start to look at what we might be able to do here. The lawsuit counties, right? So we come in here, everybody knows about this. Uh, when we look at this, we take 2010 to 2013, which included two monster years up there. 10 and 11 were big up there, okay? And we look at, there between six and 10% of the three, each of the three counties was likely not profitable all of those years, including the good ones. You don't wanna know what it is right now, because land prices are still off the charts in that area too, right? But just those acres that operated at an expected loss, we're talking about millions of pounds of nitrate in the raccoon, right? Can we have a make more money conversation to get us out of some of these kinds of issues? So we put this all together. What we've got through this precision business planning process, we can be sitting down at the same table with the farmer, with ag retail, uh, with the conservation folks and the policy folks and the financial folks. We can build this business plan and we can give everybody what they want. Uh, in the same plan, right? Not a, always everybody getting everything they want, but this is a really powerful tool for us uh, around a number of these pieces. So with that, I'll tell you guys a little bit about how we rolled this out uh, and, and what we start to see as a catalyst for the conversation and some questions here. So we run this in a few different, in a few different tiers. What we like to start is just a basic profit mapping, right? This is with public data, driving with the yield data, and what we want to do is give folks a sense of what that misallocated working capital number is, just with some generalized info. From there, we move into a whole enterprise subscription at 1995, so all your acres into the mix. And what we want to do with this is carry through primarily these first three steps and just getting started into down these last three steps of the process. So we'll include some time with the certified precision business planning specialist for training, being able to get these pieces in. We handle all of the initial data processing in-house, so that's out of your hands, other than naturally there will be some questions sometimes that uh, move back and forth. Uh, we've got a webinar series and we're going to be doing a seminar series that all sort of build around being able to get that initial assessment done. And then we move into a consultative piece, right? Because what we see over and over again is a uh, degree agronomist sitting in a room looking at your data uh, can sometimes figure some things out. But if we have somebody who understands what we're trying to do that sits down in a conversation within 10 or 15 minutes with all of that inherent gut instinct and knowledge about what's going on within every field, we can make a ton of progress. And so this is very much a consultative process moving all the way through to this whole precision business plan. Uh, and, and one of the really positive parts about it is we own it together, right? Because uh, like any plan, there's always going to be characteristics of it that are, uh, uh, you've got to have some perception 
that drives through. Uh, but this is how we're rolling uh, this service out. Um, I guess with that, I'll take any questions or thoughts about what we're up to.